All right, please turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 15 through 21. As you're turning there, please remember that the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Title to our message this morning is How Defying Tyrants Invites the Blessing of God. Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if, his, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. For they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. God bless the preaching of his word. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would make us like little babes this morning, newborn infants that long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it we may grow up into salvation. For we pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, you may be seated. So last week, we discovered that all wicked nations, if they last long enough, always turn into houses of slavery. And we also learn that God has always opposed said wicked nations for the sake of his people. Um, He is not the God of Israel or the church only. He is God over every single nation. Now this morning, we're going to see how God blesses his people when they disobey and defy tyrants like Pharaoh. And I think this is a a, a timely message for the age that we live in. Um, One of the great blessings of 2020 was that we were able to discover how deficient our theology was concerning the civil authorities. Uh, Many of us had been breathing the air and had been intoxicated with the ideology of statism. We bought into the idea that whatever the state requires of us, we should give to them. Well, this is why the scriptures, and especially Exodus, is so helpful. Um, Paul says in Romans 15, 4, that whatever was written in former days, like Exodus, was written for our instruction. So Exodus is not just history. It's written for our instruction, that we may know how God would have us to practice our faith. And this morning, we are especially instructed on how to practice our faith in the face of tyrants. What is a tyrant? Well, Webster's 1828 defines a tyrant as a ruler who exercises unlawful authority. A tyrant is an imposter. It is a usurper. What is the goal of every tyrant? More control, more power. Tyrants ought to be disobeyed and defied. And how do we know? Because God always blesses his people when they do so. And that's our big idea this morning. God always blesses his people when they defy tyrants. So let's begin with our doctrine, and let's begin by introducing our characters to this story. 
verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua. Now, I think that Moses is uh, engaging in mockery here because once again, who goes unnamed? The most powerful man in the world. And who does he name? These lowly slave midwives. Uh, Shifra means beautiful, and pua means radiant. Now, we are not told what their physical appearance looks like, but these names are certainly fitting because they became saviors for a whole host of little boys. Commentators suspect that beautiful and radiant here were most likely the head nurses of an entire uh, midwife guild mainly because of the sheer number of the Israelites. It wouldn't have been possible for just two of them to deliver all the babies. So now let's set up the plot. Previously, we saw from verse 12 that the more that Pharaoh oppressed Israel, the more that they multiplied, the more uh, that they filled the land. And so Pharaoh comes up with an even more devilish plan than slavery. He tells beautiful and radiant in verse 16... He says, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. Now, though Pharaoh is nameless here, he could rightly be called the first antichrist. Um, What is an antichrist? Well, 1 John 2.22 says, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, this is Antichrist. Pharaoh was Antichrist because he was seeking to deny Jesus' very existence by wiping out all of the offspring of Abraham. Remember, it was through Abraham, Abraham's offspring, that Jesus was to come. Now, I don't believe that Pharaoh was at all aware of this, But you have to remember what was going on in the world before Jesus' resurrection. Uh, The strong man had not yet been bound. The nations were under the control of Satan. So scripture gives us several of examples of demon princes ruling over nations, uh, preventing any righteous influence from entering into those nations. So there was a demon prince over Persia. Daniel 10, 13. There was a demon prince over Greece. Daniel 10, 20. Over Tyre. Ezekiel 28, 14, and 15. And so this is the drama that's in the spiritual realm that's happening behind Pharaoh's decision. The demon prince of Egypt was trying to wipe out the Christ child from ever coming into existence. And from this we see the implication that modern abortion not only derives itself from uh, ancient paganism, but from demonism. Now, Pharaoh, of course, was motivated to kill the male babies because, number one, Israel was multiplying at a rate faster than Egypt, verse 9, and he was afraid that they would join their enemies, verse 10. And so this Antichrist commanded beautiful and radiant to murder God's covenant children. When they came out. Let's look at how the midwives respond. Verse 17. But the midwives feared God. And did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them. But let the male children live. This is so instructive that the fear of God turns lambs into lions. Psalm 34, 7 says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Pharaoh had the ability to execute these women on command, but the the fear of God transformed these lowly slaves into roaring lions, and they stood up against the most powerful man in the world. And we learn from this, loved ones, that The fear of God is not some private religious feeling meant only for our little holy huddles. Well, here is where you fear God, but not out there. No, 
our, our theology must come out of our fingertips into the public sphere. These midwives feared God in their home and in Pharaoh's courts. And it made them an enemy of Pharaoh. I think many of us don't have a category for this today. Do you realize this, that sometimes the true fear of God will mean that the state will be as mad as hell at you. But the fear of God is our greatest weapon in this arsenal against Satan and his kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who kill the body. Do not fear those who can kill the body. Who can kill the body? Tyrants. But fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Fearing God just will require us to disobey an authority figure given the right circumstances. So apparently after this command, some status lackey had reported to Pharaoh that these little Jewish baby boys were still alive. And so he takes action. Look at verses 18 and 19. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Now, we know that's not what happened. Uh, Verse 17 tells us that they purposely let the babies live. So, we have, we have three options as to what's happening here in this passage. Option number one, the midwives lied, and they mixed their righteousness with sin. They mixed their righteous disobedience with sinful deceit. Option number two, they mocked Pharaoh, but God blinded him to it. Or number three, they knew that tyrants aren't entitled to the truth. So let's take those one at a time. Option number one, they lied, mixing sin with their righteous disobedience. They lied, mixing sin with their righteous disobedience. Now, unfortunately, this was Calvin's view. This is one of the few places that I disagree with him. Calvin seems to absolutize the ninth commandment, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, such that he believes that any deception whatsoever is always sin. Now, there are two problems with that position. Number one, the passage itself. Moses tells us that in verse 17 and verse 21, he tells us twice that these midwives feared God. They feared God. So they feared God enough to disobey Pharaoh, but they didn't fear God enough to tell the truth here? That that doesn't make sense. Furthermore, look at what verse 20 says. Immediately after their deceit, it says, so, after their deceit, or therefore, God dealt well with the midwives. Moses purposely waited to speak of God blessing the midwives until after they deceived Pharaoh so that we could see it wasn't just their disobedience that God was blessing, but their deceit as well. So the passage itself doesn't doesn't work with that. But secondly, the problem with saying that all deceit is always wrong contradicts human experience. Ecclesiastes 3.8 says there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. So what happens in war? What happens in war? Well, armies use camouflage. Spies deceptively infiltrate. Tactics are employed to misdirect. These are all forms of deceit or lying. Why then do we say that these forms of deceit are okay? Because we intuitively know that enemies and criminals don't have the right to information that would harm or kill others. Uh, We could put it like this, as one author does. The Christian is under obligation to God to tell the truth at all times where normal communication exists. 
or where normal circumstances exist. So that's option number one. Don't think it's right. Option number two, uh, these midwives were mocking Pharaoh, but God blinded him to it. This was J.B. Lightfoot's position. Look at the answer they give in verse 19. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Now, th this very well could be mockery. Pharaoh, our women are not like yours. <laughs> our women are vigorous. So just read between the lines. Your women are kind of pathetic here. Um. But, but furthermore, they say, our women give birth before we come. Now think about that. If the Hebrew women give birth before the midwives ever came, then why do we even need Hebrew, Hebrew midwives? They're mocking him, just as Jesus often mocked the tyrants of his day. Apparently, God blinded Pharaoh from being able to read between the lines, just like he hardened his heart later on. Now, I like this option, uh, but I actually think that it's just a subspecies of our next option. Option number three is they, these midwives knew that tyrants aren't entitled to the truth. They knew that tyrants are not entitled to the truth. So, let's say this slowly. Not all deceit is a violation of the ninth commandment, just like not all killing is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. Not all deceit is a violation of the Ninth Commandment, just like not all killing is a violation of the Sixth Commandment. Yes, they did deceive Pharaoh, but he wasn't owed the truth. Tyrants, just like enemies during wartime, are not owed the truth. Yes, we are under obligation to God to always tell the truth where normal circumstances exist. But war is not a normal circumstance. Tyranny is a species of war. One author puts it like this, quote, Pharaoh was at war with God and with Israel. Israel had been enslaved, its people abused, and its newborn babies sentenced to death. This was clearly war. Even more, it was legalized, wholesale murder. The midwives lied to Pharaoh to save the lives of the babies. It was clearly lying, it was clearly justified, and it was clearly blessed by God, end quote. And these midwives were clearly blessed by God. Look at verse 20 through 21. God gives them a threefold blessing. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. So because beautiful and radiant disobeyed and defied Pharaoh, they, number one, helped Israel fulfill the cultural mandate. Number two, became strong and mighty. And number three, God gave them families of their own. And that brings us to our doctrine this morning. That the Lord blesses his people when they defy tyrants. The Lord always blesses his people when they defy tyrants. So we can see that clearly in our text, but let's go elsewhere in Scripture to prove this out. So I have two proofs for you this morning. Proof number one is the defiance of three Hebrew boys. Proof number one, the defiance of three Hebrew boys. Please turn with me to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. Now, um, Daniel, the book of Daniel, is actually a case study of defying tyranny, state tyranny. So in Daniel chapter 3, we come across this story. The king of Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, he builds this gold image that's 90 feet tall. And he requires that all of the nation would fall down and worship it whenever the music is sounded. You were still allowed to worship your own God, but you had to give ultimate fealty to the state. Well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego defied the order of the king. And so Nebuchadnezzar had a furnace, and he threatened to throw them into the furnace if they would not comply. So look at chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So they defied the king. What happened? They were thrown into the fiery furnace. But guess who showed up? Christ himself. He was the fourth image in the furnace, and he saved them. And then afterwards, when they came out without even the smell of smoke on their clothes, Nebuchadnezzar made a new decree in verse 29, that if anyone spoke against their God, they would be severely punished. So in summary, God blessed these three boys for their defiance against tyranny. Proof number two, the defiance of Peter and John. Proof number two, the defiance of Peter and John. Please turn with me to Acts chapter four. Now here, Peter and John were arrested by the Sadducees because they did the horrible crime of healing a lame man and preaching the gospel. And the authorities wanted them to stop speaking in Christ's name. So look with me at Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 21. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let him go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. Defiance was followed by the blessing of God. And furthermore, God showed his pleasure upon this defiance by sending an earthquake after Peter prayed. Uh, look at chapter 4, verse 31. After he prayed, he asked for more boldness, and we read, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. So the Lord had blessed Peter, John, and the whole early church for their defiance to tyranny. Now, someone may object at this point and say, well, but you're ignorant of the history of the church, Pastor Josh, because there's many who have defied tyranny, and they have lost their lives. They have been executed for it. They've been martyred. So where's the blessing of God there? Well, first of all, I'm not arguing that at every sign of tyranny, we ought to publicly go forth and defy the authorities. In the several cases that I've brought forward this morning, these men and women were forced into a position of either compliance or defiance. There are times when fleeing from tyranny is, better, uh, is a better choice than open defiance. Uh, if you want to read up on that, go read Francis Schaeffer's A Christian Manifesto, wonderful book. But back to the objection. I would argue that in every case of justified defiance against tyranny, God always, always, always pours out his blessing, even if it costs us our lives. How can I say that? For two reasons. First, when our blood is spilled for the Lord's sake, what, what better occasion could your blood be spilt, loved ones? When Peter and the other apostles were beat, Acts 4, 5, 15, 541 says, when they left the presence of the council, they rejoiced that they were count worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And secondly, the blood of the martyrs, when, when Christians are martyred for standing up against tyranny, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Remember what I said last week, the more the church is oppressed, what happens? God causes it more and more to fill the earth and multiply. Uh, persecution is gasoline on the fire. What greater blessing is that? So that's our doctrine. The midwives 
defied Pharaoh because they feared God. And in the process, they rescued the covenant people of God. And as a result, they were blessed beyond measure. The Lord always blesses his people when they defy tyrants. So let's look now then at our duty this morning. And our first duty is that we need to consider carefully what a tyrant is. What a tyrant is. We need to know what a tyrant is. Um, children, boys and girls, have you ever heard of the story of Dracula? He was actually a real figure in history. He's not like a vampire like the movies make him out to be. Uh, his name was Vlad the Impaler. Uh, Wonderful name to name your child. He lived from 1431 to 1476, and he lived in the modern-day region of Romania. Now, when he was a boy, the Turks had invaded his land, and his father, Vlad II, was forced to, to surrender his son. Sometime later, Dracula escaped, and he ascended to the throne of his home country. And then he began to wage war against the Turks. Um, and during the 39 years of his rule, he is said to have killed between 40 and 100,000 um, people, roughly 20% of the population at that time. So Dracula controlled his people by total terror. Um, on one occasion, there were envoys that had come into his court and they refused to remove their turbans in his presence. And so he had their helmets hammered on their head. His own citizens were subjected to unspeakable tortures before their execution uh, for crimes that he simply deemed unacceptable. Now, children, that is a picture of a tyrant, a man who assumes all power and rules like a god who is unaccountable to anyone, a man who doesn't rule by God's law, but he rules by whatever fits his fancy. And so we need to be able to distinguish between a tyrannical ruler and a foolish ruler. Um, in Scripture, there were two kings that lived at the same time. King Jehoshaphat of Judah and King Ahab of Israel. Now, King Jehoshaphat was at times a very foolish ruler. He joined his son in marriage to Ahab's daughter, and he aided that wicked family in their Baal worship. In fact, Jehu the prophet later came to Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 19, 2 through 3. And he, he rebukes him with these words. He says, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Because of this, wrath has gone out against you from the Lord. Jehoshaphat at times was a foolish ruler, but he wasn't a tyrannical ruler. He deserved to be rebuked, but not defied. King Ahab, on the other hand, he was a tyrant. 1 Kings 16.30 says that Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. He was the one who stole Naboth's vineyard through his witch of a wife, Jezebel, and then stood by while she hired uh, false witnesses to testify against him so that he would be stoned. And this king was wicked. He was a tyrant. And what did Elijah the prophet do to this tyrant? He defied him. First, he defied him by shutting off the rain in the land for three years, 1 Kings 17.1. Then he scorned him, calling him the troubler of Israel, 1 Kings 18.19. And then he mocked him by mocking his demonic religion at Mount Carmel. And he said, oh, why don't you guys... Call upon your God. Maybe he's on the toilet right now. Maybe that's why he's not answering you. 1 Kings 18, 27. Elijah gave that tyrant the exact uh, treatment he deserved, and Elijah was righteous for it. So that's our first duty. We need to be able to distinguish between foolish rulers and tyrannical rulers. Our second duty is to answer an objection that goes something like this. 
Well, unless our government is hindering our ability to preach the gospel, we should always obey them. That is gross reductionism. And it goes against everything we've seen in our passage and in our proofs. There there are at least four things uh, that we should defy the state for. Number one, we should defy the, the state if they prevent the preaching of any part of God's word, and especially the gospel. Number two, we should defy the state if they require us to break any part of the second table of God's law towards our neighbor, like when Pharaoh commanded the midwives to murder these boys. Number three, we should defy the state if they require us to break any part of the first table of the law, meaning when they demand our worship from us, like in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And number four, we should defy the state to the degree that they don't stay in their lane. That's the tricky one. We should defy the state to the degree that they don't stay in their lane. But Jesus lays out this principle in Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 21, Jesus says, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. What this means is that God has given limited authority to the state, and when it takes more authority than what God gives it, they ought to be defied to that degree. So let me give you an example. Let's turn together to 2 Chronicles 26. 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 19. This is an example from King Uzziah's life. 2 Chronicles 26, 16 through 19. But when he, King Uzziah, was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. For he was unfaithful to the Lord his God, and he entered the temple of the Lord to burn incense on the altar of incense. But Azariah, the priest, went in after him with 80 priests of the Lord who were men of valor. And they withstood King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord, but for the priests, the sons of Aaron, who are consecrated to burn incense. Go out of the sanctuary, for you have done wrong, and it will bring you no honor from the Lord. So let's... And analyze what's going on here. King Uzziah was an agent of the state. He was stepping out of his lane by promoting himself in the temple of God, the church. And God struck him with leprosy for it. Now, Azariah the priest, he didn't defy King Uzziah when he was in his proper lane. He only defied him when he stepped out of that lane. And so to make it applicable to today... Whenever the state tries to regulate other institutions, namely your family, and telling you how you should educate your children, for example, or when they try to um, regulate the church, the manner in which we worship, they ought to be defied. That is tyranny. They have been given the power of the sword. They have not been given the power of the shepherd's staff. That belongs to the family. They have been not given the power of the keys of the kingdom. That belongs to the church. So that's our second duty. We should not reduce our defiance to the state, to this one thing of preaching the gospel. The Bible doesn't do that. Our third duty is to examine ourselves then. There are two extremes that we have to avoid. Um, Extreme number one is uh, to be a status lackey, to believe the state in whatever it says and to obey it in whatever it requires. That's extreme number one. But extreme number two is equally as dangerous, to be anti-authoritarian, to rebel against the state regardless of what it says, to be in constant opposition not only to tyrants but to anybody that you disagree with. So examine yourself to either of those two extremes characterize you? Do you realize that one day you may be required to disobey the state and that if you don't do that, it's sinful? Conversely, do you realize that if you are always in opposition to the state, that's sinful? 
So that's our third duty. Examine yourself. What is your disposition to the state? And that brings us then to our final duty. We must rebuke ourselves if we find ourselves in either of those two extremes. So if you're in that first group, if you're a status lackey, if you believe that we should just obey whatever the state requires of us, even when it's evil, then listen to what the prophet Jehu says. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord, because of this, the wrath of God has come out against you. 2 Chronicles 19.2. God does not hold those innocent who are accessories to evil. Um, King Jehoshaphat was disciplined severely for his playing accessory to King Ahab. Will he not discipline you for doing the same thing? Conversely, if you are anti-authoritarian, if you oppose the state in everything, then heed the warning of the Apostle Paul. Romans 13, 1 and 2, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. So rebuke yourself if either one of those extremes mark you. Let's turn finally then to our delight. Now there's a deeper story that's hidden in these verses than what we've already heard. Um, C.S. Lewis called it the deeper magic. Think, um, think hard with me for a second. This ancient story of these two ancient midwives, beautiful and radiant, who saved Israel. They speak of a of another savior. Last time we saw how we were tyrants just like Pharaoh, how we were born heartless and ruthless and faithless. But this time, we see how helpless and hopeless we are to do anything about it. Consider this generation of Israelites that we just read about. They were not born free. They only ever knew slavery. They were born in slavery under the tyrant of Egypt. They were slaves from birth. Loved ones, that's what you were when you were born. That's what every human being has been since Adam. We weren't born free. We were born into slavery. Psalm 51, 5, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. But it's actually double bondage. Israel was also under the, the bondage of the tyrant Pharaoh, not just in their chains, but under this tyrant. And we are under a tyrant, Satan himself, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, has blinded our minds to keep us from coming to a knowledge of the truth. Furthermore, Israel was incapable of rescuing themselves. As slaves, they could not overcome Pharaoh's ruthless and all-powerful army. But the truth is, is neither did they want to be rescued. Um, sure, they, they didn't like the chains. They didn't like the forced labor. But they loved the same gods that Egypt loved. If you fast forward to Joshua 24, 14, Joshua tells Israel that their fathers, this generation, served the gods of Egypt. They loved the gods who enslaved them. Even after they were rescued, they kept on wanting to return to Egypt. Loved ones, don't you see? That's you. That's you. First, you were totally incapable of rescuing yourself from the slavery of sin. Just as the blind man cannot give himself sight, you cannot deliver your own soul. But here's the thing. Just like Israel, you actually didn't want to be saved. You didn't want to be saved. Though you hated the change, you loved the tyrant of this world. Ephesians 2.2 says that you followed the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. 
You loved your sin. You didn't want God. And because the Israelites as a whole loved the same gods as Egypt, they deserved what we are reading about here. They deserved their misery, they deserved their slavery, and they deserved the sentence that Pharaoh had leveled against them, which was death. And that's what we deserved. The wages of sin is death. But then, in the fullness of time, these two aptly named saviors, beautiful and radiant, arrived on the scene. Just when the people of Israel appear to be on the brink of destruction. Salvation always comes at the right time. Galatians 4.4 4 says that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. The great tasks of these two midwives were to bring life into the world. And that's what they pointed forward to, to the Savior, whose whole task was to bring eternal life. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. And I give to them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Beautiful and radiant, they feared God more than anything else. And as a result of their righteous behavior before Pharaoh, they were blameless. Their righteous behavior saved the children of Israel. And so Jesus Christ, the righteous one, saved you purely through his righteous acts. These two women loved their neighbor more than their own life. They risked everything. Their very flesh and blood, they were willing to be cut off. They were unwilling that any of God's precious covenant children would be killed. But Jesus Christ loved his own people even more than that. He didn't merely risk his life. He laid down his life. God did not spare his only son, but gave him up for us all. He died and was buried and rose again from the dead, not for our sake, but because of his great love for us. Jesus loved us more than his own life. And finally, these lowly midwives defied the king. They defied the tyrant of this world, and they received a threefold blessing as a result, including their own children. And so Christ, when he defied the God of this world, Satan, he received a thousandfold blessing, children from every tribe and tongue and nation. The nations became his inheritance. Just as we sang this morning in Psalm chapter 2, the Lord said to me, you are my son, Today I have begotten you, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Loved ones, that's the deeper magic of Exodus 1. This story is, is, is about our deliverance at the hands of the great deliverer. Christ Jesus freed you from your slavery to sin. He cured you of your love of the gods of this world. He gave you eternal life. He imputed his righteousness to you. He destroyed the works of the tyrant, the devil. And so I exhort you in the name of Christ, do not fear, for a new king has taken the throne. Fear not, this king is with you. He will help you. He will strengthen you. He will uphold you with his righteous right hand. Beloved, Fear God above all things and his son Christ. Defy tyrants, obey God, and then wait for his blessing. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word that instructs us, that gives encouragement, that gives us hope. Lord, we pray that you would take these words and, and drive it deep down into our hearts, that we, like Shifra and Pua, would fear you above everyone else. That Because of what Christ has done for us, we do not need to fear him who can kill the body, but we only need to fear you, who has ownership over both our body and our soul. We pray these things in Christ's name, amen.